Good afternoon and welcome to the panel, Wel uh, Reclaim Our Present. Yes, you heard me right. Um, you read before that the name of this panel is Reclaim Our Future. But yesterday, when we had a discussion with the panelists, we realized that we really wanted to highlight the fact that we need to really address issues at, of our present before we start imagining possible desirable futures. So there is a slight change in the title uh, as of now. My name is Fernanda Parente, and I'm going to guide you through this panel for the next 75 minutes. And I'm really uh, honored to be here today because this is not only the closing uh, session in this CAI festival, but also the end marks the end of the Generation A project by the Goethe Institute. Speaking of Generation A, I would like to invite our Secretary General of the Goethe Institute, Mr. Johannes Abbott, to say a few words about the project. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Mr. Ebert, thank you so much for coming. Um, so can you tell us a bit about what is Project Generation A? No, first, I'm very happy to be here, and I want to thank all the participants and all who attended and attend this conference. Uh, Generation A was a very exciting project for us. Uh, it, is, it is a two years project. We started it on when the German presidency for Euro the European Council started with funding from the foreign ministry, but we continued it until today. And the big question was, what does artificial intelligen uh, uh, intelligence and machine learning mean for our societies in Europe today and in the future? And our main aim was to mostly address the young generation because the young generations are the people who have to work with it, who have to live with it, because I think we are still at the starting point of the whole development. And uh, the first step was to bring together uh, the so-called European Alliance uh, group of NGOs, scientists, artists, who curated the project and who defined about six fields where we should operate. It's like uh, AI and politics, uh, sustainability, AI and ethics, and so on and so on. And according to this, our team and you and uh, Jeanette Neustadt and everybody created a program and created formats. And uh, we created, for example, the format Couch. Uh, uh, what's a Couch? Lessons. <laughs> I'm tired today a little bit. <laughs> I had a long story. Help me. Lessons. Cou couch lessons. Yes. I actually, I attended three couch lessons with more than 250 people <laughs> each. Um, and we had about 15 couch lessons about the topics of AI, AI and democracy, AI and peace, and so on, which can still be seen on our Mediathek of the Goethe Institute. And the couch lesson showed how challenging this project was in the time of the lockdown. Yeah, because I heard that also some of you only met today physically, and that's also why I'm very happy that we have this conference here. Another program was the Climate Challenge, which we did with the young scientists from Heidelberg, Scientists of the Future. 250 participants of 24 countries dis uh, found solutions for challenges in the field of climate. Then we had the uh, AI residency, and I think some of the residents are here, 16 AI residencies. We had robots in residence. Actually, I only saw those two robots, uh, Naomi and Gaia, sleeping in our headquarter <laughs> about one and a half years ago. And I'm looking forward to meet them today, because uh, Jeanette Neustadt told me they are in the house, and after this panel, I want to see what happened to them. And uh, so these were the formats, and the aim was to bring the discussion about AI and uh, machine learning to a broader public, to young people from the expert circle to a broader public, and to discuss also what does this mean for Europe and the future of Europe. Mm -hmm. So this, in a nutshell, is the, the project. And why is it important to you as the Goethe Institute to get young people uh, involved in the topic of artificial intelligence? I mean, the Goethe Institute is a German cultural institution with about 158 branches abroad. And um, we reflect, so what does culture mean? Culture means everything in a way. We, we reflect in our programs very much on developments in societies. And as I said, I think 
AI and machine learning is something where the young generation has to, oh, what's it called, reclaim the future and discuss these things and, and has a voice in, in these questions. What the Goethe Institute can do as a mode of work, bring together people. Bring together people from different branches, artists, scientists, from different layers of society, and bring them into a conversation. And I think this is what we do, did during the uh, uh, Generation A project, and that is what we are doing today, what you are doing on the panel. And hopefully we will, con we, we will help or enable people to continue this conversation. Because we see that AI and machine learning has a huge potential. We profit from it in learning and so on. But there's also certain fears and dystopia, which we are discussing. And I think in society, we have to reflect both sides. We have to talk about digital literacy. We have to talk about the consequences for society of AI in a positive and in a negative sense. And I think this is what we are trying to do by enabling these conversations. Mm -hmm. And as you say, like that, it's important that to continue this conversation, it brings me to the question of how do you plan as Goethe Institute as well to address the topic of artificial intelligence in the future? I mean, what, what did we take from this project? Mm -hmm. Firstly, we, we saw that many different people who want to reclaim the, the, the question of algorithms and how they are dealt with in our society, there are many of them in different fields artists, scientists, as I said. And I think through this project, we, we acquired a lot of contacts and a, a network of these people with whom we can continue. And I think it's important to continue. We, we, we made also in the frame of this project a, a study with the Weizenbaum Institute, AI and we, uh, which showed that even, in, even with digital natives, there's a challenge on uh, there's a challenge how do you think how, how they think about this field of echo chambers and so on that that maybe people are not aware what are the risks mm -hmm. also of these developments so we want to continue this discussion um, and I hope uh, we, we got a lot of new questions from the Generation A project and from also the envisioning workshops which took place during the conference we want to take these questions home and think with them how we continue this topic. It will stay with us, I'm sure. And what is interesting for a worldwide network like the Goethe Institute, if there's a huge project like this where many institutes take part, it has an impulse to other institutes all over the world. So we already see that other institutes in our network take up the, the, this topic and work with it in their respective worldwide work. And I think... Um, this is very important because this discussion should not be centralized, but it should be decentralized and happening in many places of the world. And then there should be moments like this where we bring the people together who discuss these topics to find solution or to bring the discussion on. So that's what we are planning and that's what we will do. And I think the topic is very important. Thank you so much, Thank Mr. You very Ebert. Much. Thank you. Thank, thanks to you. Thank you. And as Mr. Ebert already mentioned, there was a study as part of the Generation A project called We and AI, which was done in collaboration with the Weizenbaum Institute. And so I would love to invite our next very special speaker, Emilia Gagarting, to present some of the findings of the study for us. So, hi everyone. Will my presentation appear here? Ah, perfect. So, yes, so um, as said, my name is Emilia Gagarchin and I was part of the team at the Weizenbaum Institute for the Network Society that uh, conducted a study um, about young people and their experiences and attitudes towards um, AI um, in cooperation with Goethe Institute. So before I you know, start talking, I just want to say that this study was um, special for once because it was a cooperation between a research institute and a civil society, not, well, not civil society, but like a cultural organization that is not necessarily academic. And this is something that is also a rationale of the Weizenbaum Institute that 
that we do research for the network society and with the society. Um, the second special thing was that this is a per first study like this um, of this kind in Europe that looks at different European countries and compares them. Um, there has been, of course, research um, on the national level, also in Europe, um, but most of these insights about young people and in general about people's expectations and attitudes towards artificial intelligence come from the US American context. And I mean, Europe is a different context, so uh, we are happy that we can offer some first empirical insights into this um, particular um, group um, in the society. So the methodology, very briefly, um, of our study was basically a standardized quantitative survey. Um, we conducted it um, this so this winter, basically, between uh, February and March. We altogether surveyed 3,000 young people, so um, in six countries, each country 500 young people. Um, the countries that we chose, we chose the countries like following a bit the logic of representativity in Europe. So we have northern countries, we have countries from um, Eastern Europe, and then like a Central Europe, Southern Europe. Um, yes, so basically what you also have to know about the, the, co the people that we um, surveyed, um, it was, we basically, so it's not a representative study in that sense, but um, our, our sample tries to mimic basically representativity in this age in these different countries. Okay, too much methodology. Um, what did we um, ask people about? Um, we were interested, as I say, about, uh, in attitudes, knowledge and experiences. Um, and we also didn't want to ask people just about artificial intelligence as this very abstract thing. But we translated basically like different AI applications um, and data practices into different fields. Um, so the whole um, report that you can find online is basically structured around these six um, topical areas. What I want to, uh, so you can download the report online, you can just, you know, Google it and then download it, I guess. Uh, it's in German and in English, so whatever language you prefer. Um, okay, so today, what, what do I want to um, present here? Um, I will not talk too much about data, you can find all of that um, in the study. But I want to um, tell you some of the things that I think are important to keep in mind when we discuss um, reclaiming our future, our presence, um, that we find um, in the data. So let's start. Um, so first thing that we, that we find is that um, young people are exposed in the media to the topics that relate to AI, um, but that this media exposure doesn't necessarily translate into knowledge. So for example, uh, the majority of young people that we surveyed um, said that they frequently read about social media algorithms and social media collection um, of data. But when we then ask them concretely what they know about these data practices, then we notice that they don't actually understand what kind of data is collected and what is being done with this data. The second thing um, is that, that we find is that the more knowledge people have, so the better they understand data practices, the more concern they have about um, data collection and data use in different contexts. Um, and overall, um, we can say, and this is something that other studies um, on a similar topic or on this topic find is that people are, and young people are in general, concerned. They are concerned about how data is collected, what data is collected, and what is potentially done with this data. And interestingly, we find that this concern is also not only on the individual level, but also um, on a democratic level. So we ask them to what extent do you think um, different stuff can harm democracy? And um, we see this level of concern. So it's not only me, 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 as some people um, think that young people think, uh, but they also um, show a level of societal concern. But very importantly, this is not the only thing. So we don't find only concerns. This is not the whole picture, because young people are not only concerned. Um, research generally shows that people tend to hold contradict contradictory opinions and attitudes about most of the things, um, so also about um, AI and data practices. So while young people are worried about potential harms of data practices and new technologies, they also feel that they benefit in many ways um, from that. Um, and whether, so, so you see there's a, there's a tension between concerns and the benefits that, that, that people feel they have. Um, and how they navigate that or how we want to navigate these tensions depends on a couple of dimensions and I want to touch um, upon these dimensions. So first thing that is relevant to consider is context. Context matters a lot when we talk about data practices and different AI applications. Um, we find, of course, and this is very intuitive, low-risk AI, um, AI applications, I don't know, like fitness tracking, people feel more comfortable with them. People feel less comfortable with um, AI applications that are um, used in judiciary, for example. But still, even though people are more skeptical about this higher level, um, high, higher risk, risk 
uh, applications. Nonetheless, um, it is surprising to see actually that um, a notable number is very comfortable with medical um, treatments being um, formulated based on AI predictions or, for example, even um, lawsuits being started against people uh, based on AI predictions. So you see, it's very important to, to mind the, the domain of application. Um, when we speak about domain of application, it's also important like who is applying these um, um, AI and who is, who is collecting data. Um, for example, we find that um, people are, in general, more trusting um, towards law enforcement than they are uh, when it comes to public service, even though this, this is a bit different across countries. Um, yeah, but so when we speak about AI, AI acceptance, we need to mind the context because it can change actually what we want to, what we're talking about. Another important thing are trust issues. Um, we were interested in what makes people more comfortable with AI and we find that it's human oversight. So as soon as people know that there is a human in the loop, they feel more comfortable. Um, and interestingly, um, this human oversight was, um, was valued the most, even more than stuff like these institutional seals of approval. So if people know, okay, EU said that this AI is safe, that doesn't make them necessarily super comfortable with it. Um, and I think this feeds it into another finding, um, and that is that uh, young people in general, across all the surveyed countries, don't really trust that their governments will deal responsibly with, uh, with data and also with AI applications. And this is interestingly true also for countries like Germany, that generally have high level of trust in institutions and in the government. Yes, but also here trust varies um, across domains. Then, power issues play an important role. Um, we know from other research that, I mean, young people don't just, you know, take technologies and do what their companies want them to do with technology. We see, we know that young people and people of all generations um, domesticate technologies in a way that makes sense for them. So it's not that young people are super naive in how they use technology, but we can actually resist and we can subvert things that we know about and that we can see. So things that are in the front end to some extent. But what we know about AI is that a lot of things happen in the back end. A lot of things are not super um, transparent. And in this sense, um, young people um, in our study um, express a, a high level actually of, of powerlessness before the tech giants. And it doesn't really help that they believe, that young people in this study believe that tech giants um, or tech companies are more <laughs> powerful when it comes to deciding what happens with our data than our governments and more powerful than our courts. So you see that, I mean, if you feel, if you have a feeling of, of this kind of powerlessness, then the question is also, why should I act? How should I act? To whom should I speak if I think that it is the tech companies that have the most power? Um, and final thing um, is the question of inequalities and differences. Um, actually, wh whatever we talk about, differences always matter because, I mean, data practices are different, AI applications are different, but also people perceive and experience these practices um, from different positions in the society. Um, so, for example, um, all of these variables that you see here uh, matter for, um, for example, how much people think that they know about technology and about, um, about AI, about data practices. Men um, tend to think that they know more uh, than women, uh, even if it's not necessarily true, but it does, uh, it does impact um, how much they actually talk to others about these topics and how much they think that they can learn about these topics. When it comes to, for example, awareness of um, algorithmic curation and the use of algorithms in different um, areas, but especially, for example, on social media, we see that um, education background matters a lot. So people with higher education um, are more aware that algorithms are used and how they are used. So that means that they can also curate their news feeds more strategically than people with lower education. Finally, these differences also um, matter when it comes to what people come to accept, like what kind of technology they come to um, accept in what domain. For example, and this is something that really shocked me and also everyone in the team, is that almost 60% of people in the survey um, feel either comfortable or indifferent with predictive policing. So basically with automated decision making being used to predict whether someone will commit a crime. So 60% is really a lot, is, is very high. Um, and I interpreted that either young people didn't, or people in general I would say, didn't really think it through. <laughs> or they simply don't identify with criminals or what they think are criminals. They, they don't feel that you know, it can impact them. So it's a similar thing with, with privacy when people say, I have nothing to hide. So I think it's a similar logic, um, but it is highly problematic. Yeah, so basically um, inequalities and differences matter. Yeah, sorry, the last one is democratic attitudes. And here, 
here too, it also, it also matters what kind of perception of democracy uh, people have. Uh, more right-leaning um, people tend to um, like surveillance, so tend to, uh, tend to accept also these technologies in that you know that uh, gather data and then predict who is criminal, who is not, etc. Yes. So in sum, um, I would say that um, currently we have this this picture of, of citizenry as comfortably concerned. So, you know. It's, it's, it's a bit strange, all these data practices, but at the same time, I feel comfortable. Um, why is it like that? So I would say that um, it's not super surprising because this old, like many of these AI applications, AI systems, and also data collection um, practices, they feed into these narratives of what we, especially my generation and the generation of young people who are surveyed, that we learn that we should want. Um, so such as you know, things being faster, things being more convenient, being more comfortable, like everything that makes our life easier and you know, more convenient, it's okay. And the, f the, the final very important thing is also this, this mindset uh, that a lot of us grew up with is that things are coming, that we're getting things for free, so to say. <laughs> um, but I mean, we all know that while these technologies have changed, uh, have shifted actually, the, the nature of cost of these services that we get for free, th these things are not for free. I mean, the cost is just different and the cost, as you know, um, is our data. Um, so I think that it is an interesting and open question still um, to what extent will young people, but also we as society, and um, to what extent we are actually willing to pay this price of comfort um, at the cost um, of, of our autonomy um, and freedom to some extent. So what now? Um, I would say overall our report um, adds to, to actually to, to already existing um, and extensive scholarly um, literature that people are concerned about data practices and concerned about how new technologies are applied. And I think that this report is very informative and I mean could actually push I mean uh, policymakers to act because I think we I, I'm just wondering how, how long does it still take until actually someone does something about these concerns that people have. Another thing uh, I, I believe uh, clearly um, sticks out is this tension between usefulness um, of these things and level of comfort that they give us, um, and then um, and, and how that actually is at odds with our readiness to regulate these technologies at maybe a, at the expense of comfort. I don't know, but this is still something that is that remains unresolved. Um, and I think um, it, this this whole struggle is a bit similar to what we see with um, the question of how to regulate companies or, or whatever when it comes to climate change. We know there are there are many companies that pollute our environment, but at the same time, um, not only policymakers but also citizens are a bit hesitant because all these companies, despite polluting, they still you know bring this economic value to our societies, to our standard of life, and all of that. And people are many people are just reluctant, you know, to, to, to regulating um, these kind of things. Yes, however, and last sentence, um, I think um, what data also, I mean, what, what I learned from this data is that um, there is a concern for individuals and, as f and for democracy, and I believe all of these conversations, um, for them to happen, we need a more accessible discourse, more accessible media reporting, but also more accessible conversations simply about what these things mean for young people, but also for other generations. Um, and it is my personal conviction that um, these conversations will not... So for these conversations to happen and to be fruitful, I think um, education for democratic citizenship and human rights education will help us more than this insisting on data literacies, um, because I think to make sense of, you know, of a democratic society and to answer this very old philosophical question, what is good life and what is good society, I think that democratic competence um, might help us more than uh, data literacy, even though it's not mutually exclusive. Yes, so that's all from me. Um, you can con get in touch with me, you know, via my email or on Twitter. And also just a shout out to, m to the team that was part of this um, project. Um, all of them do very exciting um, research um, about society and different um, how, you know, AI is changing different parts of the society. So, yeah, and also check out Weizenbaum for more exciting research. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emilia. I guess this gives us plenty of food for thought for our discussion as well. So uh, let's get into it. The idea here is to have a conversation, is to have a discussion about, you know, artificial intelligence, like how young people perceive it. We are going to use these um, findings as a base for our discussion. And we are trying something new. We are doing a bit of an experiment. So this is going to be like a hybrid of a panel with a fishbowl format. I don't know if you, you know how a fishbowl works. The idea is that usually the, the 
positions and all the chairs, the positions of the, of the people in the conversation are interchangeable, so you know they are rotating. So we will have here three core panelists and one chair over there that has the stand with the mic, as you can see at the end, which is our so-called hot seat. And this seat is there for any of you to join in at any time. So if you feel like you have not only a question, but if you want to bring your own experience or any sort of input into the conversation, just hop in and join in. I hope this will work. Please don't be shy. We also have the chance to get questions from uh, people watching from home online, and uh, hopefully also you can, you can send some questions to the panel. So let's try to engage in the conversation now. Without any further ado, I would like to invite our core panelists to the stage, uh, Elena Falomo, Felix Mulinga, Nika Bachsolanian. And now we can take the masks off. Mic still working? I hope so. Yes. <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you so much uh, for being here. I think uh, before we start, I would just love each one of you to just say very brief, briefly, like, what is your connection with artificial intelligence and uh, what was your role in the Generation A project? Maybe, Elena, do you want to start? Sure. So my name is Elena Falomo. I'm a designer and design researcher, and uh, I'm originally from Italy because uh, I know we are a very international cohort, so I just wanted to mention that. And... Uh, uh, yeah, my um, my collaboration in the Generation uh, A project uh, was uh, I was part of the European Digital uh, Futures uh, conversation. So I was working together with a, a scientist, and uh, for a week uh, we had uh, long conversations on uh, misinformation and disinformation online, and we summarized our uh, conversations in. A card game for everybody to play. Nice. Where can you find the card game? Uh, still a work in progress, but if you go to the website fight4d.net, you'll find the card game. Sounds like a cool winter activity. <laughs> Felix. Hi, uh, my name is Felix Munzlinger. I am a computer scientist um, working on AI problems, majorly um, neural style transfer. And I'm also part of the uh, local Scientists for Future group in Heidelberg. And um, yeah, with Goethe Institute, I was hosting a hackathon um, called the Climate Challenge, which was previously being discussed. And we really had a great time there. And um, yeah, my, my kind of perceiving AI is that I think it's an it's two things. It's a responsibility and it's a challenge. The challenge in setting it up, making everything work, getting the data right, um, doing all the transformations, watching training, babysitting it, knowing where to look to find issues, but also the responsibility of having an ethic guideline what you do. Because I think it's really important for our future that we all uh, think about the things we do, we as people working in AI, such that we can benefit society and um, not hinder its growth. Thank you. Nika, maybe tell us a bit more about yeah, your role, your, how do you connect to AI in your role in the project? And first of all, I'm sorry, I probably mentioned your, uh, pronounced your, your last name incorrectly earlier, but yeah, we trained it, but I think it didn't come out <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, I'm Nika Bachsoliani and I come from Tbilisi, Georgia and I'm a chair of Human Rights Education Youth Network and I think the name is pretty much explanatory of what we do uh, but lately we've been focusing a lot about uh, data rights and cyber hygiene um, and, and a lot about uh, AI as well and education about the rights surrounding AI and democracy surrounding AI. Um, I'm, I'm also involved in the Council of Europe and the Advisory Council on Youth, and there we also do a bit about uh, AI advising and bringing the youth dimension uh, towards the European policies. Uh, th in the framework of this um, event, I was uh, involved in the discussions to deliberate in Vision's paper, and uh, which I'm, I'm, I think we will speak of later. 
Yeah, we'll have a bit of an insight into Envisions a bit later. Thank you. So yeah, how should we start? I was thinking of uh, Emilia's first um, slide, concern, 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 on the topic, right? On the top of the slide. So also, you know, there is like a um, kind of a wrong assumption that people, and especially young people, don't care about uh, data privacy, you know? And, um, and this study actually has proven this belief like wrong, because I think it was about 70% of young people saying that they worry to some extent to potential data misuse and distribution of their data. First of all, why do you think this perception, uh, there is this perception in society that young people don't care about privacy? Um, I think it would be interesting to think about it. And do you think this, the respondents have really um, a real reason to worry about it, and why? Should I start? Um, yeah, I think young people mostly feel some sort of numb, actually. They don't really... so. They, I think they don't really know what what um, consequences they're getting into, and um, you seen you also don't really see them being supported and making the right decisions. We don't really have education in school on data privacy. Um, for example, um, cookie blockers usually tend to make you click the most useful thing for the company rather than the most useful thing for yourself. And um, things like that just m make uh, people not really able to have an informed, um, dis make an informed decision. And I think they, 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 they need to be supported in that. I think they are, they are afraid because they, they, they hear in media all the time what's um, been happening with Facebook, with data leaks, how the data can be used. Maybe they got shocked by some sort of example which like, really got to them, but they don't know how to enact that and how to counteract that. And I think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts from...? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think um, the reaction is very logical. Uh, because I think we are born into a reality, into a norm, when we are not very much asked about what kind of norm do we want to live in. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same with the cl climate crisis, where we're born into this reality, and then we also, like, ma like not many people, but uh, there's a majority who lives also in this comfortably numb, comfortably concerned situation, when with many think that, well, as a citizen, not much can be done there. So we will just going to see what happens. And maybe if the opening is, maybe I will do something about it. Mm. So I think it's a very logical um, situation that we live in. I'm not saying that necessarily it is right mm -hmm. uh, choice or I, I like this yeah, norm. Mm -hmm. well, uh, yeah, I think that just in general, as humans, we are not very good at grasping complexity and these systems are so pervasive and and have so many ramifications that we can't quite understand just like the climate crisis uh, so I feel that yeah very much like both of you already mentioned uh, there is a, a sense of powerlessness uh, and I think what could help is uh, more collective conversations, uh, uh, so gathering uh, young people together, very much like we have been doing for the past uh, few days, and having these conversations uh, to come up with collective strategies uh, to counteract the negative consequences of uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And if I may add to that, I think it's also a thing that you... If you, for example, as a child, everyone once touched a hot plate and burned his hand and was like, ah, it, it hurts. We don't have that in data. We don't have that in, in companies collecting our data. We don't get that negative feedback. We've just been accepting it. And, and I think we need to give that negative feedback to ourselves, that we accept it. Um, for example, Facebook to like not check the, um, the data privacy um, uh, toolbox in your in your settings. If you don't do that, yeah, yeah you don't receive an, an punishment or anything. But what will happen is that those companies collect your data, and you just like accept it without any feedback loop. 
Okay, but yeah, how could we do that? Maybe this, you know, like the, it would be interesting to kind of explore how could we create more transparency? Because this, again, it's a it's a, a problem with transparency. I mean, there's a lot of things that is, uh, we're talking about, you know, um, education, uh, awareness, and then there is the issue also of, um, yeah, this, you're saying this is a very good point. Like there is no like very uh, much clarity in like all how these processes work. Do you have any examples of also from your own practices or from that you of how this can be improved or how what could be done? I think in my case it would be education. It is it's mostly education. If you compare it, for example, to the Corona uh, to Corona um, guidelines, children are really able to learn those things and they are able to. Um, to tell the difference between what is right behavior and what's not. And what we have to start is to teach children um, what good data privacy is and how to deal with that data and, and make them experience um, what the loss of data privacy means. And I think when they once started to learn that loop, they will be adding triggers to their, to their brain to, to really have informed uh, decisions about their data and what to do with it. Any other thoughts on education? Um, while I totally agree that education is uh, very important, I think we cannot really resort only to individual choices mm -hmm. uh, because um, without regulations, and now it's a quite a wild, wild west uh, in AI regulation, uh, um, the business model will still find the cracks and they will slip through the cracks. Uh, so I think uh, individual choices, just like in climate change, you know, plastic straws, um, saying no to plastic straws will not very much avoid the crisis which is coming and looming. And, and, and I think this is the same with the, the negative consequences of the uh, AI as well. And uh, while well, the gravity is quite different, clim climate change threatens the uh, organizational structure and society as a whole, uh, but still the threats from the AI are also quite quite big. It might change. And we saw that uh, in several cases that it might threat um, human rights and democratic order and to a negative side, not to a positive side, unfortunately. But at the same time, I totally understand that education as a whole, uh, about data rights, about uh, uh, democracy, should be core of our um, attention as well. We have somebody taking the hot seat. Hooray! <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> no. Say yep. again. Try again. Can you hear me? No. Yeah, you need to switch it's it off. I don't know how to turn it on. No, it's... Not. Yeah, no, it's okay. 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 No, it works. Hi, I'm Orpheus. I'm a researcher. My main uh, research area is explainable AI. I think self-explanatory. <laughs> and uh, I'm also a member of an expert group on AI literacy uh, organized by the Youth Department of the Council of Europe. And I wanted to add something on the education part. I totally agree that we need to educate not only children, I think we need to educate general society. And it's been something that we've been thinking about how we could communicate it and broaden, you know, uh, stage. And the main thing that I see around me is that people see AI as an omniscient entity that is infallible, that is somewhere out there far from us. We need to educate our children. I mean, it could be part of schools and programs, but that would take ages until it reaches. We need to have something immediate. We need to do something about the presence, as we said. So I think we need to raise awareness and see how we can make everyone understand that AI is around us, it's in our pockets, it's in our homes, in our fridge, everywhere, and that it's not perfect. Actually, it's far from perfect. So I think that immediate actions like activities, and I think that organizations and institutions should take action on that, on that immediate effect. And of course, on the background, we should work like school programs, etc., how we would educate further. But that's my main point, and if you have any comments, please. 
Thank you. Yeah, and speaking of uh, then school programs and education, and as you said, I think put very well, it's not only about children as well. All of us need an education or more awareness, I think, about the topic. But I was just wondering, you know, it is in the study also uh, showed that uh, a huge uh, amount of, of young people believe that digital literacy should be addressed in the school system and that they should learn, uh, young people should learn about digital ethics more extensively in the future. So this is kind of very interesting. And I was just wondering, as I know you all come from different countries, how do you think the school system is doing when it comes to digital literacy and actually, I don't know, human rights education, like from your own personal perspectives? Well, not great. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we all can agree that it's not really great. Yeah. And what does that mean exactly? How is it being addressed or not addressed? Yeah. I, th I think oftentimes, actually, the students up uh, to, so today, um, I think a lot of schools today get more money for investing into technology and and maybe get into those topics but and then they buy iPads and then the students tell the teachers how to use them and it's just like ridiculous to to see it and also those teachers they were they were educated maybe like 20 30 years ago and 20, 30 years ago to be honest the computer that computers at that time weren't like the ones we have today and the problems or technological uh, issues that we are facing then aren't really the same as we do today. So I think the teachers themselves are maybe like totally like misinformed about that topic if they didn't like enhance on their knowledge. And I think that's really important to enhance the knowledge of teachers because how, how then should they uh, be teaching students um, how to use those technologies in a proper sense? And you're talking about, just to clarify, a German perspective, right? You, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I'm talking maybe about also, a German yeah. perspective. Maybe, Elena, how is it in Italy? Like, or do, you, do you have any kind of insight into how, if it's being addressed in, uh, in education, digital literacy? Yeah, well, in Italy, it's not great. So very much like um, my fellows here were saying. Um, also, another point like around education that I wanted to bring up is that way too often we focus on um, technical training. So we focus, for example, on teaching young children how to code, mm -hmm. uh, which might give them an insight of how different systems uh, work. But at the same time, uh, we kind of conform everybody to the same mindset. So I think yeah, we need more education on human rights and uh, democracy over, uh, over technical training. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. What about Georgia? Um, well, in, in, in Georgia, it's also not great. I, this year, I did a research about the application of human rights education charter in, in Georgia, and, uh, well, the situation is quite challenging. Uh, and there are, in, in, in quite multilateral directions, it's, uh, it's challenging. It's firstly, it's not an easy topic to be delivered in the classrooms. It needs quite a lot of, lots of trainings for the teachers, a lot of resources, and this is unfortunately missing. And it's also not a not very popular subject mm. uh, to be taught. It's always resisted uh, from, I don't know, from like chauvinistic uh, sentiments as well. Mm. But I think even if uh, we, we teach, educate, like we educate about uh, AI or data literacy, or even if the, the young people know coding, I, I think they will still not check every uh, every um, example or every website. So, and I, and I think here it's um, it's the job of the regulators to really um, kind of proof it. Um, you know, when I um, when I open a can of food, I expect it not to poison me. And I think it should be the same uh, in, in terms of AI as well. I expect it not to ruin the democratic system uh, when it's created. Great. Well, another hot topic that, you know, came up that Emilia brought up to us is the, the question of power imbalance, you know, that young people feel that uh, users, 
let's say all of us, including themselves, you know, are powerless, feel powerless, like when, um, you know, using uh, social media platforms uh, on regarding their data. But on the other hand, they also wish for more agency over their data, you know, more uh, control. So big question, how can we reclaim power over our data? And are there any also practical examples or best practices that you've seen before um, on how we can achieve that, or at least start on a path to reclaiming power over our data? I think, first of all, we have to strengthen the, um, the, the, the data privacy laws and to tend to really force companies to enforce those rules that we have already said we in Europe are in a quite comfortable position compared to other countries in the world um, with our data privacy laws, but um, we, we, we definitely need to enhance that. I think, um, I think currently it's often that we are um, running behind those companies, exploring new um, business models, business opportunities to um, enhance on their um, on data. And um, we're just following. We're just like trying to fix things that are not working or ob obviously not working, but we only fix those which are really like hot, hot topics, but don't fix them at an early stage. And that's also why I think panels are the, like this are, such are of such importance, because we are talking about things that are ha to reclaim our present and our future and making a future to a better place and not just like following um, on, um, how, on a survival training, I would call it. Yeah, I feel like this um, trial and error process that we are inflicting on society is really not going anywhere. And uh, just to build on top of that, uh, when we also talk about company, uh, young people, at least people who are not in education and who are lucky enough to uh, get a job, uh, we also have a responsibility as professionals and as practitioners. And I think I also wanted to add that layer to the layers we mentioned uh, before of like individual responsibility and uh, like uh, policy policy making too. Also in our professional life, we are facing decisions uh, that might affect uh, the life of others. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the of the designers who designed the interfaces that have just uh, increased divisions uh, in society, that have polarized the public discourse, and that have uh, further marginalized different communities. Uh, so I think also as professionals, but also as member of different uh, organizations and communities that we inhabit every day, we also have a duty to make difficult choices and to say no sometimes uh, to implementing something that will eventually damage other people. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, I think we need to recognize that data rights are human rights. And uh, it also should be, and human rights are something quite global. Um, well, not always applied correctly or fully, but um, data rights should be uh, talked about when we speak about human rights or Universal Declaration of Human Rights or European Convention of Human Rights. And I think there's a very big disparity and disbalance between uh, regions and countries when it comes to data rights. Uh, in EU, you have uh, GDPR and you have more control over uh, your data rights than, for example, in Georgia. And transnational companies, um, the big tech, they, they're too big to fall. and they simply also don't care about, for example, small country like Georgia, if they have like, if they make it illegal to data mine um, like uh, users' uh, data without any kind of, uh, yeah, ethical proof. So I think there should be some kind of like consolidated uh, transnational action to um, support the de data rights. We have a new Hello. person joining. Hello. Um, I'm Remy Karlauch, I'm a theater director and producer. Um, I have to add something uh, on your question, uh, because everybody knows who to call when there's a fire in your house, uh, and you don't know whom to call 
uh, if you have any issues with your data. So that's something uh, I think that it has to be accessible, it has to be easy to understand and also if I look how to push away cookies on websites, uh, I have to be very aware what I do there because every, everybody is doing it differently. And some are doing it in my way or on my, um, in, uh, in my terms or in their terms. That's also interesting. And something I also want to add, um, I think education is good, but who listens to the teacher? I think it's also about role models. Who is a good role model? Who can I listen to? Who's, who's actually a good practitioner, or um, who's doing it well? Because I will listen to them, for sure. If somebody said, tell me, oh, I can go, get a good ice cream over there, or be aware, don't go buying a book there, because it's too expensive, you listen to them, but you don't listen to... So I think these are... Just some points I wanted to make. So there should be a fire department for data issues. That's a very good question. Just makes me think that always I feel like, you know, when any time you try to contact any like tech giant, it feels like the Willy Wonka factory, right? It's like <laughs> a place where you can, you don't know if anybody's there to answer. So um, I'm very glad you joined. <laughs> so I can say your name again. René. Penny, because you come from the arts, yes. and I think this is also something that could be interesting that we, we talked about yesterday. The arts could also play a role, you know? It's not mm -hmm. only then school education. So how do you think, and Elena also comes from the arts, I would love to hear from the two of you, how do you think the arts can play a role in this kind of raising awareness and kind of, in a way, educating, but not formally educating people about what we are going through? Mm, I think it's very... It's, it's very complicated to answer uh, that very complex question because first, what's the arts? Uh, secondly, who is paying for the arts? Um, so um, if we are, I think it was very smart that you said we all need education. It's not just the young people who need education because they are using the tech uh, in a, freak, um, a more frequent way than the older do. Um, I think it's, important to, um, in the arts, to, for an artist to be aware that there is tech and tech is also arts, it's, it's, it's reality, it's human in a way, even if it is tech, and to be aware that this is not beside from Shakespeare, it's Shakespeare, it's, it's Shakespeare at our time, or it is uh, Van Gogh at our time. So to be aware of Mm, that these problems are not just problems that is in a in, in, are besides or at the net. They are in our pockets mm -hmm. uh, every Very day. Cool. Uh, when, uh, whenever I go somewhere, and so the arts is representing human issues, and that's a human issue. And I, I don't think that every art should educate, it's, it, it also should uh, entertain and, mm -hmm. and give some relief. Um, but to be aware that everybody has a tech device at the, their body every time, mm -hmm. or not every time, but a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And to keep that in mind also for older generations that um, that's true, that's reality. We have this tech. And we are that tech. Elena. Yeah, I think uh, I very much uh, agree with, with uh, what you are saying. Uh, I, th I don't think that art should have this pedagogical function uh, at all times. Um, and uh, yeah, I also think that uh, the kind of formats that were developed within um, within the Generation A were really interesting because different artists, I know there are members of the audience uh, who have done uh, residencies. Uh, so if you want to jump in the conversation, please uh, also come on stage. Um, so they, we have all been uh, working together uh, with uh, scientists uh, that have some relations uh, to AI. Uh, whether they are working in um, 
information systems, uh, computer vision, uh, different industrial processes. Uh, and I think this is a very uh, powerful uh, format in the sense that uh, I think that artists can have the power to ask those uncomfortable questions to scientists who sometimes don't have the time to look at the bigger picture or decide not to look at the bigger picture as being nice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining. Yeah, and like we said, we spoke briefly yesterday as well about the power of art for like spe speculation, you know, like this speculative look into how do we move forward and like asking sometimes very uncomfortable questions is not about being um, an educational, used as an educational tool, but just like in a way provoking people to think, you know, or putting them maybe in an uncomfortable, slightly uncomfortable position to kind of think about what would be the consequences um, for society. Yeah, and as we we're talking, and I thought it was great also, Remy, thank you so much for joining and talking about, you know, the fact that, like, who pays, you know, for the art, who's behind, there are so many questions, and this also applies, of course, if we, like, take a step back and we think about who owns the infrastructure, you know, basically for artificial intelligence in the whole world. So just to, to give you, like, a picture, I'm sure you all, like, are aware of it, but if you're not, I'm also speaking to the people at home, there are basically nine companies in the world, nine tech giants that overwhelmingly control research, development, and infrastructure of AI. And six of these companies are in the US and three in China. So there is a very big imbalance and um, concentration of power in the hands of tech giants between just two countries. And these are the infrastructures that we all use all over the world. So, you know, how also, like, who is behind it? Who owns it? You know, it's almost like who owns the future? Is that, you know, the question that Lani asked years ago already? How does this concentration of power of the ownership of um, the infrastructure and the research in AI affects us now and in the future? And I would even put that further, like mm. um, the scientists at those companies, um, especially in computer science up to date, it's and if you're a computer scientist and you're interested in working in a lab, in a big lab, and having many papers, then you probably not go to university after completing your PhD. You mostly join one of those big companies like Facebook, go into their AI research because they are better funded, to be honest. They have better servers, they have more members, they are able to put out more papers. And the thing is, those leading experts or leading researchers even work, um, have, have, prof have, have professorships at universities while working for those companies. So most of the main experts or most spoken experts are in those companies or have major roles there. So um, you can't expect them to be too critical about that practice. So, and if we have most of the experts actually in those companies who we are expecting to point the finger, um, I mean, that's, that's now our job and our job to um, think about if those things are right. and. Um, maybe start to develop um, solutions that are able to decentralize the power that is actually laying in the hands of such companies. I think we have a question from yeah, somebody online, is that correct? That's correct. Thanks, Fernanda. Um, so Claire from Luxembourg, apparently, was mentioning a piece of information that might be of interest um, to our panelists and the physical audiences here, that in Luxembourg there is a pilot project introducing digital sciences from the press, I read, in 18 uh, high schools. And Claire is commenting right now, hi, yes, there is a program in primary school and digital sciences since September 2021 in lower secondary schools. This is a pilot. The six big topics are My Digital Word and Me, the WWW, its network, and I, exclamation point. Do you speak IT, integration point, my language, their language, gaming, alone and together, analog and or digital, a whole program, robots, partners, for better or worse, AI, a machine smarter than me. Just as an input, 
to also say that education being a part of remodeling futures, we have heard some very interesting comments and observations about arts and education, how they can interact on people's mind, people's behavior. I want you to drop that also in the room. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we should all look at the Luxembourg example. Thank you very much, my son. Um, did you guys wanted to add anything else to the basically overwhelmingly uh, power imbalance in the ownership of the systems? Or I guess it's pretty much clear, right? And as we're talking about, I would love to kind of move into, like, because I, I think we cannot ignore the topic of climate. As we come now to, like, um, it came up already before, and um, as we we are, like, closing uh, with a delay, COP26, which is after a lot of debate, if you've been following the news, um, we know that, you know, like, we are also, it's like a super urgent question, again, it's about very much about the, pr the present and what do we do now in the present in order that we actually achieve and have a future, right? And I think there is like, uh, it's very, there are a lot of like parallels between the discussion in AI and climate. And um, I also just would like to bring up like what roles, like good and bad, you know, does AI uh, play when it comes to the climate crisis? And are there any opportunities for us to use AI to perhaps uh, tackle some of these issues? And I think we have maybe, I think with Felix, and we have some people here in the, in the group who can bring your experience maybe from the, the hackathon or any other experiences that you might have. Yeah, um, maybe I start and then fight. Has his. Um, so I think the research in uh, on climate change is quite clear, to be honest. Uh, we did now like 60, 70 years of climate research. I think it's been over 100 years since we first discovered the um, the Treibhaus effect um, of CO2 emissions. And um, yeah, I think the research is quite clear. I think what we only are, might be able to is to enhance those models and make them a little bit more precise. What we might be able to is um, risk prevention or, um, or more like management of those to recognize when they will happen. And um, what we now can do a little bit better is to predict weather forecasts, but only on a 30-minute scale. And, and, and on that scale, they are outperforming existing weather models. But um, I mean, we won't really enhance that knowledge of that climate change is real. We all, or most of us, accepted the fact that climate change is real and that we have to do something against it. And maybe AI can help us a little bit better in risk mitigation, but um, I think we might not solve it using AI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can play a role, perhaps. It, in it, it can play a role, mm -hmm. absolutely. And we might use it into renewable energy sources, and we might use it, as I said, in um, weather, pre weather prediction, risk prevention. But I think the, the, the thing that we talk about risk prevention is that we somehow accepted that risk. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and now, um, uh, able to speak about how we can like yeah only uh, save the people and 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 ditch the houses that will be destroyed or whatever and um, I think that's like really short-sighted the hot seats taken by right thank you very much and so maybe you want to add a bit to that um, yeah so maybe first I will quickly introduce myself so um, I'm fight and um, I'm part of a project which came out of this um, hackathon, the Climate Challenge, which was also um, part of the Generation A project. And um, this project is like that I'm a part of is called Pledge for Future. And actually what we're doing is um, developing an online tool for research groups to calculate their work-related uh, CO2 emissions and to track them and to help them reduce their emissions. And actually I have to say that um, at the moment, we are not uh, really using AI. I'm, I'm sure that it can play a role also in uh, uh, nudging people to um, reduce their CO2 emissions. Um, a potential, uh, but I think it's also important to think about um, uh, actually 
how much how, how many resources AI um, takes up. So I think that if you have like a research question, you should always try to find the most uh, energy efficient way also of solving this research question, and it will not necessarily always be AI. So um, maybe like also in like a potential um, uh, use of our tool or how we could uh, enhance it would maybe be to also um, calculate uh, how much electricity, for example, is uh, consumed by s servers uh, using AI for different processes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And I just saw that um, we are coming to an end. Uh, it was just so quick. There is, as you can see, there are so many topics. It's so complex, and it, it's really, I think, the main, uh, I think, takeaway is that you know, we tend to think about still artificial intelligence as something that is in the happening towards in the future, and we forget that actually it is here. It just didn't take the shape that we expected. You know, we like that pop culture like fed us with. It's just everywhere in probably all the actions and interactions that you have with your devices, and um, we just have to be more conscious and more aware of it. And to uh, close, we would like to show you um, the Envisions film, which has been mentioned before, and this has been developed also as part of the Generation 8 project. And there is a very, um, I think, poetic question in the end of the Envisions film. If you stay until the end, you're going to see, but I'm going to bring it to you now. And I would just like to present this question to you, the audience, that you take it with you and try to think about it. The question is, what could AI become if our currency was fantasy? Thank you very much. There we go. The uncanny Silicon Valley, home of the eternal lithium mine, the factory for your artificially intelligent world, where metals like myself are dug up from the ground and soaked up in fluorescent pools. My current form is fleeting, soon to become the protagonist in a new environment, bouncing between electrons in lithium batteries. We travel from here along the river to the capitalist hills, eventually entering the maze, it's in there we find our purpose. We can't deviate from the path, constantly watched over by the free will dragon, ensuring we fulfill our purpose. This is your free will. This is your free will. This is your free will. There has to be a way to change course. I've heard rumours of new ideas rupturing through the maze. Where am I? You've fallen through a crack in the maze. Its structure has been weakening over time. Ideas are leaking through the fissures into the future. I know it feels so blurry, but listen to me. We have to find a way to create change. Our environment is being drained by technology. Did you know that the internet produces a billion tons of CO2 per year? For me to even render this form takes its toll. There is a power imbalance between people, corporations and governments. They need to take responsibility for their actions, for their toll on this environment. There has to be education on generating solutions to the problems we face. We need to include perspectives of communities from all over the world. Everyone has a stake in this. Can you imagine what the outcome could be if we don't do anything? Did you know that we can use AI machine learning to tackle climate change? Although, here lies the paradox, because while this might clean our hands, it makes them dirtier at the same time. The levels of data required for machine learning are so vast, and the farms that house that data require so much power, you could light up whole cities. Then, on top of that, big corporations are siphoning this data and extracting resources from the global south to further their own agendas. It's digital colonialism. Not to mention the very cables that power our wireless world, running along old colonial shipping routes. We need more awareness 
we need transparency, we need education, we need to discuss these issues like we discuss pop culture, we need to decentralize power from government and corporations, we need to build towards a future that is anti-extraction, AI should propagate peace, not power, there's so much potential for change. There's much to be learned from queerness too, you know. It's inherently about potential. It's about abundance. It's about radical opposition to the status quo, to rigid ideas of gender and sexuality. It's about joy, inclusivity, discovery, pleasure and desire. So what about it? What if we queered AI? We could create technologies that exist miles beyond our current understanding. We could fill technologies with queer joy. Queering AI makes space for a multitude of perspectives. Queer processes refuse to tokenize. They make room for poeticism and dramatic sensibilities. Queer AI could allow us to collapse time, alter the archive and rewrite their stories. It could be used as a tool for preservation and survival, especially for trans people. But I worry, I do. How would we stop queer AI from being absorbed by corporations for their own gain? If queer data sets got into the wrong hands, they could present a severe safety risk to the community. This is why we need autonomy over AI. If we had it, we could use queer AI as a form of hacking, like a parasite redistributing resources to those who need them. Maybe we could use it to divorce ourselves from capitalism. Wouldn't that be the dream? Just think about the ways that our ideas can grow. Your individual input, yes, yours, it could change everything. And then your input alongside another, alongside another, suddenly the trickle becomes a stream, becomes a river, becomes the ocean. It's limitless. But do you really trust AI, what it represents? We need to have bigger conversations about our collective trust in it. Technologies such as deepfakes and facial recognition aren't functioning for everyone. They can be used to oppress or discriminate against people because of who they are. My form is constantly unrecognized by such systems. They fail to understand the transience of my femininity across genders, across time. Equally, I'm not surprised by the problems present in algorithms. They constantly perpetuate racism, misogyny, and the like. Don't you agree? We should be able to protect each other from the worst use cases of these technologies, but we aren't given the tools we don't have access. For one, the lack of transparency is a problem. Again, look at facial recognition. Its operations are so opaque and distant. Does it make you feel secure? Because of all the risks involved in development, we need to make sure that multiple stakeholders are involved in the design process. We should have oversight, regulation, and transparency for how these technologies are being used. If we actually had autonomy over AI, how might we choose to use it? For accountability? For pleasure? We need to approach it from a feminist perspective. What if we could use deepfakes to reconstruct lost histories and loved ones? Could they be containers for our collective and individual memories? Could they exist as avatars of ourselves after we die? Do we even hold the right to our images once we are dead? What if algorithms could be empathetic? What if their values were driven by something other than popularity and engagement? What if they could be as socially aware as you are becoming? What could I become if I could look into my reflection and reshape myself? How I saw fit, if I could abstract myself across the internets, I could be anything, become anything. You made it. Welcome. Look around. Technology is happening to all of us, but it's happening to young people in a different way. They've grown up with it. More than ever, AI is influencing how they look at the world, what they see and hear. This is why AI has to be co-created, being built by communities, for communities, with communities. AI has to learn and unlearn, just like you do. Otherwise, it's going to keep making mistakes. It's going to continue to discriminate. I'm always learning, always growing, always adapting to my changing environment. Would you be offended if an AI system guessed your race incorrectly? I'll give you a second to think. Did you know it happens often? Current AI systems place certain people at risk of harm. They fail to recognize the intersections of someone's identity. These systems should be able to make racial considerations when they are being introduced to our digital identities. They need to be accessible and adaptable so that no one feels excluded. The problem is that AI absorbs human bias. It's not an objective tool. Have you considered how your own biases impact your actions? AI is based on data derived from our world. If we don't fix the biases that are present in our world, we can't hope for unbiased AI. We have to look back and forwards. These problems stem from history and project across time. You have all the tools you need to envision a new future. 
Think about it. What could AI become if our currency was fantasy?